Rise and shine, my sinners. When Father Evil starts his day, he gets a little deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee has the richest, smoothest flavor you'll find anywhere. It's sinfully delicious. Once you go deadly, you never go back. Order yours at GetDeadly.com. Coffee's so good, it's scary. Hey, this is Rigor, host of Then Is Now Podcast, and welcome to the Cult Movie Lounge, where we discuss all cult films all the time. Joining me is my co-host, writer, and award-winning blogger, Robert Manell. So glad you could be doing this uh, with me, Robert. How how you been? Good. Uh, nice to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So, folks, we did a sneak preview episode prior to this, so hopefully you've had a chance to check that out. It's got some good responses from listeners. And now we're really going to get into the nitty-gritty of cult movies. And on this op- episode, our topic is, well, why don't we let Al Pacino tell you exactly what our topic is? Sergio Cabucci. Hey, who, and who's that? The second best director of spaghetti westerns in the whole wide world. That's right. We are going to discuss the career of legendary Italian film director Sergio Corbucci. That was a clip of Al Pacino from Quentin Tarantino's film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now, um, Robert's going to go over a lot about Corbucci, um, and I just want to mention that the films we're going to discuss today are Goliath and the Vampires from 1961, Moving Target, a.k.a. Death on the Run from 1967, Django from 1966, The Great Silence from 1968, and The Mercenary, also from 1968. So, uh, Robert, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about Sergio Corbucci and in, in his career? Uh, yes. Now, this is a, everybody not, may not be familiar with the name Sergio Corbucci. Uh, he was an Italian director who lived from 1926 to 1990, died at the age of 63. Uh, he made 63 films, interestingly enough, in that period. Wow. That's a, so that's a lot. He, he made his first film in 1952. He, I'm sorry, 1950, and his last film in uh, uh, 1990, the year he died, or 1989 or 90. So basically, he made 63 films in a 40-year period, which is pretty good. That's more than a, a film a year, you know. And uh, he made all different types of films. Uh, he was uh, known as the other Sergio, the other Sergio being Sergio Leone, who directed the famous Clint Eastwood Spaghetti Westerns, which made Clint Eastwood into an international star after he had been a television movie actor, okay? And this is where it gets complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and he started off with the um, with Sword and Sandal movies, which are, aren't those also known as, is it Peplum or Peplum films? <laughs> films. Okay. They're pepper films. And once again, I have to go back to Sergio Leone. He was a friend of Sergio Corbucci, who was born around the same time, and they both died the same run, 1989-1990 period. And they were friends, and they worked on films together before they became famous individually. And they worked on uh, peplums in the early 60s. And one of the ones they worked on, or 1959, I'm sorry, they worked on The Last Days of Pompeii. Uh, they were oh. both assistant directors to a, an older Italian director who became ill, and they kind of took over as uncredited directors, and that was made with Steve Reeves, who had just had a success with Hercules. He played Hercules in the Italian-made Hercules from the late 50s, and he later appeared in the last days of Pompeii, which you may remember. It, it was shown on television a lot during the 19. 60s and 70s. Yes, yeah. It was about the Pompeii explosion, and there's like a 
melodramatic plot about intrigue in the in the the court of the evil emperor, you know that type of thing. Right. It's a pretty it's a pretty well made film. Sergio Carbucci and Leone were worked on the script, and when the director got ill, they they were actually directed certain scenes of it, and it was being filmed in in Spain. And Corbucci and said to Leone, he said, you know, a really good Western could be made here in Spain because they were looking at the landscape they were working in. And it's very, it's very similar to the look of the old West in the southwestern United States. It's like uh, very hot, and very dry, lots of deserts, palm trees, things like that. It had a very similar uh, environment, a very similar uh, meteor- meteorological uh, plane. It had a very similar landscape. And Leone said, right. And they, after that, they both worked on another, were working on film scripts. And in 1964, Sergio Corbucci made his first Western. And it was called The Gunfight at Casa Grande. And Sergio Leone made his first Western. It was called A Fistful of Dollars. And, right. Uh, the Corbucci film was not a big success. The Leone film was a huge success. It launched the career of Clint Eastwood who was like a grade B movie and television actor for Rawhide, who suddenly became a huge star worldwide because of these Italian Westerns that Sergio Leone made. In Spain, mostly, they were filmed on location in Spain with interiors in Italy. Uh, now, Corbucci also made another film after that called uh, Minnesota... Minnesota, Minnesota Clay. Minnesota Clay. Yep. And um, I keep getting that mixed up. I was going to say Minnesota Slim. <laughs> <laughs> Minnesota Clay, okay. And a very good film with Cameron Mitchell. Kind of a, a tale of an old gunfighter. Pretty good movie. Not as good as Fistful of Dollars. Not as commercial. So they they both started out making Italian Westerns in 1964. And Leone would have three huge hits with Fistful of Dollars for $3 more. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly were all huge hits in the 1960s, and Corbucci made a few hit Italian Westerns, which we'll talk about. And uh, Leone's career decelerated after that. He made uh, another Western, uh, Duck You Sucker, Once Upon a Time in America, which didn't do as well. Once Upon a Time in the West, which was many people thought was his masterpiece, didn't do that well in the U.S., really, but it's a great film. Oh, yeah, I love that movie. Yeah, and it's, but it lasts like three hours, and it's very slow-paced. Yeah. But it's, a great, it's, a, it's a great movie, okay? It's, it's not really and a lot of action, but it's a great movie. And and so we're talking about Once Upon a Time. Now, now we're going to flip over a little bit. We're going to talk a, just a little bit about Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which came out in 2019. Right. Okay, great. Now, the thing about that movie is that many people noticed that it had a lot of clip, a lot of clips from cult movies in it. Italian cult movies, which we talked about last week or the last podcast a bit, it had clip from had clip from a Sergio Corbucci film in it, uh, Death on the Run or Moving Target as it's sometimes called, a spy film with Ty Harden it had a clip from that in it, and the main character in Once Upon a Time in America, uh, Rick Dalton was playing a washed up kind of Western actor from from a TV show in the late fifties and early 60s, called in the Tarantino film, Bounty Law, okay? Right. And he was ha- he was having a hard time getting work after that in the late 60s in Hollywood as, as, as it shows in the film. And he had a Cliff Booth played by uh, Brad Pitt was his double, stunt double. And they were having a hard time making a living because Westerns were kind of going out of style then, you know? Yep. And it, they were big in the early and mid-60s. But this... Uh, Bounty Law was supposedly in the film. Tarantino, a lot of people think, based it on a, a a show, a TV show, Hollywood, film in Hollywood, but done in 1958 to 1962. There are 63 episodes, and it was called, there are 68 episodes, I'm sorry. It was called Bronco. It was about a Bronco kind of cowboy, Bronco Buster, rodeo kind of cowboy who wandered around the West. It starred Ty Harden. Right. Okay, who went to Italy in the mid-60s and appeared in Sergio Corbucci's film, which we're going to be talking about later, uh, Death on the Run or Moving Target. 
And he had a career very similar to the main character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in that he was a star of these Western in the late 50s, early 60s, appeared in a lot of shows. He wasn't. A, he didn't make him a superstar. He was like a TV star, which was different. He appeared like in some other movies like PT-109 about John F. Kennedy's adventures during World War II. He, he appeared in several other low-budget or high-budget American but well-known films, but he wasn't paid very much. He was having a hard time making a living. He went to Italy and he appeared in Westerns. And uh, one of the Westerns was based on a Sergio Corbucci Western, Minnesota Clay. It's called a different name in the film. And it's, another director is identified as doing it, but it was based on Minnesota Clay. And he also appeared, as we said, in this movie, um, Target or Both on the Run. So, so Ty Harden's over there, and he's having a similar career as the main character Once Upon a Time in America. He's, he's over there because he can't find work in the United States. So he appears in these cheap Italian westerns, spy films, and other films. And he came back to the U.S. in late 69 when the movie takes place and was started to appear in American uh, television movies, American television shows. He went back and made a few Italian westerns. And then he kind of disappeared from acting, and uh, he died in... 2017. He was on Facebook, by the way, Ty Hart, and I was He was a Facebook friend. He had very outspoken political beliefs. <laughs> and uh, as I could tell you, he would post mainly about those, but he seemed like he was a kind of a nice guy. He was, and he was like 87, I think, when he died. He wasn't a big movie star, but he was well known for appearing in all these cult movies, including some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. And I think Tarantino must have picked up on that. Uh, that he was basing this these characters on people who actually existed, not only Sharon Tate in the Manson killers, but he was also posting it. He was also basing it on these characters who were acting in Westerns and low budget TV shows in the late fifties and early sixties. And so a lot of people think that the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio, a lot of critics are finally pointing out that, Hey, that's what this film was based on. It's based on this, uh, this character It's based on this old, Western show, which everyone forgot. And that's where the characters, that's where these characters, the main characters come from. And of course, they were played by actors people know nowadays and were very popular, like Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. Okay, right. that's that said, at the same time, uh, going back to the early 60s, uh, these peplums or Soren Sandal films were very popular. And so Corbucci, who had been making up to this point, uh, kind of melodramas. He made musicals. He made comedies. He made a few comedies with this Italian comedian, very popular comedian named Toto. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I've, I've seen some of his movies. They're not my type of humor. They're not very funny. They're kind of very corny type humor, you know. <laughs> he, he, Kobuchi made some musicals and it's the kind of music that I don't really, I watch bits of them. It's the kind of music I don't really get in, into. It's more like, they're more like family films, okay? Yeah. They're kind of very, very corny for, for you know, like the general Italian movie-going public who, like, paid very low admission prices, like 10 cents in American money to see these films back in the 1950s. But he made this film. He made a few peplums. One was Steve Reeves, okay? Uh, uh, another one was Steve Reeves called, uh, called uh, Son of Spartacus. A lot of action, very well-made film. Made in 1961, I believe, and then he made uh, he made another one with Gordon Scott, okay, and that's called Romulus and Remus, okay, Romulo A. Remo. It was kind of like a not really a big hit, but uh, they changed the title in America. But Gordon Scott was one of these muscle men, American muscle men, who worked out a lot, and went to Italy to appear in these. Sword and sandal films, and he was uh, in like six six uh, Tarzan movies where he played Tarzan. Right. Yeah, none of which I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> but he he was he was more of a star than these other people were talking about. He was a, he was a kind of a TV star, and he went to Italy to appear in these sword and sandal films, where he played like Matisse or Samson or Goliath. Yeah, uh, and, and Goliath and the Vampires was. Directed by Sergio Carbucci, it was the second. It was it was his third, I think, uh, sword and sandal film. I shall take your 
shape, and in your likeness I will destroy my enemies. Into waters abounding with vicious killers of the deep goes Goliath. Men die by the cruelest of executions. A beautiful woman is the devil's own temptress, exploiting the young and innocent. The original title was Maquiste versus the Vampires. Maquiste was a, an Italian hero, but no one in America knew who Maquiste was, so they changed his name in the dubbing to Goliath. Right. Okay? And Gordon Scott was this really built-up guy. He was probably just as built up as Steve Reeves, but he wasn't as well-known. He had huge muscles. He was supposedly a heavy, heavy drinker. He got he got the... Apparently, he got, he got his license revoked when he was in Italy for drunken driving. Oh, so he, he was a real party when he was over there. They had a lot of parties among the American actors who were over there. And he had, he had some difficult problems later in his career where he kind of couldn't get movie roles at all when he came back to America. And he was trying to find any type of job. I mean, he tried to get a, a job as an actor in The Godfather Part Two. And, they were, and Francis Coppola rejected him and said, no, he's not right for the role. So he couldn't get jobs wow. in mainstream. He couldn't get. And he, he he looked like a he looked like a he could play that type of gangs gangster role, but he couldn't even get a job in mainstream films. And he ended up um, he ended up you know he was having a real hard time. He lived with family members. He lived with some of his uh, fans at some point, and he he had a real kind of tough life later in his career. Um, Steve Reeves is more successful. He had a horse farm, but Maquiste El Contro El Vampiro or Goliath. And the vampires, he played like a Goliath, who's like this muscle man, and his his town is invaded by barbarians. And he later finds out that his family was killed. The head barbarian is not a human; he's really this kind of vampire. Okay, and uh, he's uh, he kidnaps all these people, and he's he's using their blood to like create a, a army of vampires or zombies who can't be killed. Right. Okay, because he wants to take over the world. So he's using human blood to take over their bodies and injecting it to them, and he uses mind control, this vampire. He's going to take over the world with these vampires or zombies or whatever you want to call them. And Gordon Gordon Scott, Goliath, comes in and destroys his plans. But before he destroys the villain, the vampire, he, the vampire creates himself in Gordon Scott's Goliath's double. So at the end, it's Gordon Scott fighting himself, okay? Right. <laughs> if he, because the vampire disguises him himself as Goliath, so it's Goliath versus Goliath. One's the vampire, and one's the good guy, okay? Yeah. But it's a it's a pretty neat film. It's it's very well it's very well made. It's very fast paced. A lot of action. Uh, it's got like vampires. It's got zombies in it. The color photography is real interesting. It reminds me of kind of like Mario Bava, who made these very stylish, colorful horror films. It's kind of photographed like that if you've never seen any of those. Yeah, like uh, Hercules in the Haunted Cave. That's a good yes. job of film. Yeah, yeah, Hercules in the Haunted World, I believe it's Haunted called. World, that's right. Yeah. It, it's got, it's got lots, lots of different titles, though. That, that, that might actually be one of, the, <laughs> one of the titles in Europe, you know? Yeah, it's the Haunted World. And Christopher Lee plays like a vampire in that, who's the evil vampire king. And he takes over people's minds, and he's drinking blood and getting the blood from you know, um, Hercules, his wife, making her into a zombie and using the blood to create an army of zombies. Yeah. So it's the same plot, only it was directed by Mario Bava, and it was done in the same year as that, and they're both very good films, although this one is not as well known. Uh, but it, it's very similar to that. I would recommend uh, Hercules in the Haunted World or Hercules uh, versus the Vampire. It's out on Blu-ray now, and there's three different versions of the film on the Blu-ray with three different titles. It has a commentary by Tim Lucas who explains in detail, which I can't really go into about, <laughs> you know, the differences, but it's a very good Blu-ray to get. I think you can get it like for $10 or $12. Oh, I'll have to check that out. So it's and Goliath it's, and the Vampires? 
No, no, no. That's uh, the the Mario Bava film. That's oh, it. oh, oh! Hercules in the Haunted World. Okay. Right, but it's not, it's got like three different titles, three different versions. Now, Goliath and the Vampires. That was supposed to come out on a DVD, uh, but it didn't work out. It might be out on a very cheap DVD somewhere. So I saw it online in a very high definition version with subtitles, and it was kind of worth watching. Hopefully that will come out on Blu-ray someday, you know? Right. But that's right. a very interesting right. film. <clears throat> that was Sergio Corbucci's film, and it's very stylishly directed. It showed that like, he was as talented as doing... He could do horror films. He could he could do a horror sword and sandal film like that was. It showed him as he was as good a director as like Mario Bob and some of these other well-known guys. And uh, then, after he made that, uh, he went into other types of films as we're going to discuss nice and i just wanted to mention too that gordon scott was also not only did he play tarzan in quite a few films too he was also in the movie danger death ray which was right. di directed by gianfranco baldanello right and that's a very good film too i actually have that and uh, that's on you can watch it on youtube very high definition very nice version i have it on um, oh i have it on an old vhs you know it's, it's a very fun film yeah yeah and he made after he after he appeared, Gordon Scott in these uh, in, the, in these peplums or sword and sandal films, and he also made some westerns. That he made one called Buffalo Bill, Hero of the West or Far West. We played Buffalo Bill, yeah. and they're kind of old fashioned westerns, but made in Italy. He, he then he made a series of sword and I'm sorry, of, of spy films in Europe, and then his career just ended like in 1966 or 67, with I think I think Danger Death Ray. Or uh, Top Secret, I think, was another one. There, and then he couldn't get any more acting jobs for the rest of his life, basically. Right. He became, I guess he became like a kind of an alcoholic. He was having health problems. And he lived into his 80s, though, you know, but he had a very tough life. After he fell out of the movie world, sometimes it's very hard to get back in, you know. But he couldn't get back into it. Right, right. And that seems to happen to a, a lot of these people, especially in like the 60s and 70s, where they almost get typecast. And then right. they, even though they can act, they can't get the jobs. Right. And that's what's happening in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Al Pacino, who's, who's Rick Dalton's, Leonardo DiCaprio's agent, tells him, well, you're getting typecast as the villain here, you know. You, now you're appearing in all these television shows like the FBI as the villain who was killed at the end. OK. And he basically tells him. You don't, you're not going to have any future in a few years, you know, because you're just going to be in people going to remember you as a from this old cowboy show who played villains and then just disappeared because, you know, the the major studios or no one's going to want to hire you. You're going to be washed up. And he gets really upset, the character Rick Dalton. And then he that's what spurs him to go to Italy to make these films. Right. Right. That's awesome. So let's move on to Moving Target, also known as Death on the Run, which I watched this a, a, quite a while ago. I think you, you and I first started talking about doing this show a couple of years ago, right. and I watched it then, but I really enjoyed that movie. It's a, that's, right. I think that one I found on YouTube as well.
And that movie stars Ty Harden, yep. American actor, as we said, who had this, who also had this uh, Western show called Bronco and ran from the late 50s to the early 60s, four years. He made a regular living at that, and then had a hard time getting work in America. So he went to, he went to Italy and he made films with Sergio Corbucci and other Italian directors. Now this one by Corbucci, uh, Death on the Run, he plays like a, a criminal. He plays like a thief, a kind of a petty thief who's in Athens. And what he does is he, he like steals jewelry, he like steals paintings, art. He's like, he's kind of like Cary Grant and it takes, it takes a thief, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, only he's a good guy, but he's a thief, but he's also a kind of good guy. He's just trying to make a living. Although Cary Grant had a lot of money in that film and he, he stole expensive stuff. This guy's kind of stole, steals cheap stuff and yeah. just making it. Is just making a living. Nonetheless, he gets arrested. They're going to put him in. Jail. They're going to put him in jail, and he uh, is transported to Athens on his way to being put in jail back in the U.S. And he escapes from custody, and he spends the rest of the movie running away from the uh, from the Greek authorities, from Interpol who are after him, yep. and and from these secret agents from the Soviet Union, one of whom is played by Michael Rennie, very yep. famous actor, you know, who is in. The Alien and the Day the Earth Stood Still. People yep. remember him from that. And I think that was one of his last films because he was over in Italy and Spain too. He moved over there. He was, he couldn't get any work in Hollywood either at that time, right. believe it or not. I always Once remember he, him from, um, he was in a two-part episode of Lost in Space called The Keeper. That was always one right. of my favorites. Yeah, I heard about that. I haven't, I like to see that. I'm a kind of a big fan of Michael Rennie. Yeah. But he, was a good, he was a good actor. And once again, after he fell out of feature films in Hollywood, he disappeared like it. On TV, like yeah. in, like in Star Trek, right? Yep. And, and, and remember, uh, was it Star Trek? I can't remember now. Uh, but was it Star Trek he was appearing in? Okay. Well, like I said, it was Lost in Space was the one that I okay. remembered him from. Okay, okay, the Lost in Space. Okay, that was a hit show. Star Trek wasn't really a hit show. I don't know if he was on that, but a lot of a lot of these actors were talking about appeared in, appeared at shows like Star Trek. Okay, when they couldn't get jobs in the motion picture industry in the 1960s anymore, they would go to shows like Star Trek. They would go to shows like Lost in Space, or they would go to um, other TV shows where they could get regular work at. Right. I mean, I also remember him from Demetrius and the Gladiators with uh, right. Victor Mature in that. Yeah, yes. And I remember seeing, I saw that in a movie theater when I was a kid. Yeah. And he, he would play all these dignified roles. But once again, when he got to a certain age, he couldn't get hired anymore. For big pictures in the U.S. by Hollywood, so he started appearing in TV shows like Lost in Space, and, um, and by the late '60s he was over there and making films with Sergio Carbucci. Okay, another European. He appeared in, in a Paul Nashi film where he plays an alien, uh, a Simon Terry. Simon Terry, yeah, right. Which I've got on Blu-ray now. Came out earlier. I think nice. that I th that might have been his last film, and then he just didn't get any work whatsoever. He just kind of disappeared. I guess he retired and died a few years later. But in any case, that that's the running theme here. These actors not be able to find any work and ending up making Italian films, as in Once Upon a Time in America, I'm, I'm sorry, Hollywood, and as in uh, uh, the real life of these stars we're talking about. Right Now, so he appears in this as a secret agent for Russia. And Ty Harden is the main character, is running, he's trying to, he's trying to get him to go to Russia to defect. The police are getting trying to get him to go to jail for all the robberies he's committed around Europe, and it all takes place in Athens. There's a lot of photography, like of the Colosseum and all the, you know, all the interesting, you know, famous scenery and tourist attractions there. Okay. Oh yeah. No, and uh, I mean it's not really a great film, but you know, it, it, you could tell it wasn't that expensive. It was kind of like a very low budget Italian film, but it's an interesting film. It holds your attention. And it's not like it's it's kind of like one of the inexpensive, cheap James Bond imitations they were making during the mid '60s. Right, right, and and that's what's cool because you know that's one of the things you and I have talked about that we're going to definitely dive into is a lot of those Euro spy films from the right. '60s and '70s. Right, right, and we'll be doing some shows on those. We'll probably just be talking like about one or two films in one of those shows. So this is more. Here we're talking about Sergio Corbucci, who had a career where he did all these films. So it's that's why it's so complicated his story. Okay, right. He had a very complicated career, but 
yeah, so he makes he makes this film, and then what Quentin Tarantino does in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he uses a clip from this film, and then intercuts, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, so he appears as the main character instead of Ty Harden in the film. Okay, there's a car chase where you see Ty Harden trying to escape these agents who are behind him in another car, and what they did was they superimposed Leonardo DiCaprio over him. So it looks like he's in the film, but it's actually a Sergio Carbucci film, okay? I and, love uh, that. That was such a great and, scene, too. Yeah, and it's, it, it, a lot of people who saw that film, Once About Time in Hollywood, might not even realize it's, that that's a film by Sergio Carbucci, the same guy who made Django, which we're going to be talking about, and other famous violent westerns. But that was just one of the films he worked on. It made some money. I don't think it was a big hit here. And... and, and and so, yeah, it, I mean, it's it, it's on YouTube under the title, I believe, Moving Target. I mean, you can watch it. It's it's fun. It's a good way to waste 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think on IMDb it's listed as Death on the Run. It took me a little bit to find it, but um, I always I, I forgot Ty Harden was also in uh, Berserk with Joan Crawford. Right. He was also in that. Yeah. And I think that was... Um, I think that was the late 60s. I don't even, I've never seen that film. I don't know what year that was. Yeah, that was one of Joan Crawford's last films. Right. Because after that, she, she I, th- I think Trog was her last film. But uh, she went into, look, she was on television. She was on Night Gallery, the one directed by Steven Spielberg, which got good reviews. Yep. I think that was one of her last roles. I've seen a few Night Galleries on my antenna TV now. I <laughs> quit cable, I've got antenna TV. And they, they're showing Night Galleries all the time. And that, that was a fantastic series. Oh yeah, that was that was as good as the Twilight Zone. Only was a little bit. Only they only was they had more money and it was they had more time to tell the stories. Which I think that was one of her last roles. But Berserk was a few years before that. So, I, yeah, he's he's in that. He came back to America. He, he he did that film. He did some other big films. Went back to Italy in the early seventies, and then, like I said, just he went into other things and just had a very sporadic career after that right right but, but he he's good in this film ty hard and he a lot of these films from american actors would go over there they have other people dub them but he dubbed his own voice in that film because these films in italy were largely made without any sound they would just have the people saying like one two three four five and then dub it all later because you could film a lot faster that way you know right and, right in italy, in italy they don't do it in the same perfectionist care as they did in hollywood you know they just did like one or two takes and then move on and they, they would like do a film like in a week you know yeah oh yeah it's it's interesting how that whole dynamic how that worked back then and uh i just looked it up real quick so berserk was 67 and that was her last movie i'm sorry right. trog was her last movie as right. you as you said um but after that she was on the tim conway comedy hour and joe right. crawford was also in the sixth sense but not the um not the uh, m night Shyamalan version it was from 1972 Right, right. Okay, yes. Yeah, she she didn't have much. Of, she didn't have a. She didn't, she no longer had a Hollywood career. She had a, a television career. Okay. Yeah. And uh, unless you want to say Hollywood, you know, seventies television, I guess, was also produced in Hollywood. <clears throat> that's right. how that's how Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, started out by Duel, which was a Hollywood film. Which yeah. Was, a lot of people think is his best film still, and he also directed Joan Crawford in a episode of night gallery right which had got got very good reviews i've never seen that one by the way i'm still waiting for that one to come on my antenna yeah. tv but but that's supposed to be a very good one of the best episodes of rod serling's night gallery right hey you know what's uh, not to get too far on a tangent but i liked the night gallery one with roddy mcdowell i just remembered enjoying him in that one as a kid he kept calling this guy porter boy he's like hey porter boy come over here you know <laughs> okay right you know he might he was he was he was in so much He's had he's in so many movies, so many televisions that I lose track. I, I think he was probably in more than one night gallery too. He may have been, yeah, that's true. I mean, he was in so. I mean, he was in like the Planet of the Apes. He was. I mean, he was in. He was in everything. Oh yeah! Oh my God! He was in so and, many. And he and he made movies. He was made, he was appearing in movies as a kid back in the thirties and forties. Yeah, yeah. And we just talked about him over on that is now we're doing a series this year in October for vampire movies, and we talked about Fright Night. Which he was so good in that movie, and even rewatching it this time, there's a, a couple of scenes that he's just acting with his face, and he's just so amazing. Right? Yeah, he was a really he was a really talented guy. He also directed a few films, and I, I think he made like a few 
European cult movies, which, which if I can find, maybe we'll talk about them yeah. in the future. I remember seeing a horror film. I can't remember more. He, we'll, we'll talk about him in the future, though. Yeah. He's, he was a very talented guy. He did a lot of different things. Yeah. He, I remember he was in a Hammer film called It, which was yes. very good. Another film I haven't seen. Okay, yeah. Oh, but, yeah, it's a good yeah but he, he definitely had a European career also as some of these people. I think he was a little more successful because people knew who he was. He was in, like, the Poseidon Adventure. Yeah. He, even after he appeared in these European films and television, he would go back and be in big films. Okay? And he did a lot of voiceover work, he too. Like, he did the um, the Mad Hatter and Batman the Animated Series from the oh, 90s. Really? That's inter- no, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did a lot. He had that distinct voice, you know? Yes. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the really good actors, like, I was thinking I was just watching a Peter Cushing movie. He had he had such a wonderful voice, you know. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, not only did he look, did he? Yeah, but he was a classical actor. But he had that wonderful ringing voice, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, he was in Star Wars. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Peter Cushing. Yeah, he was the villain in Star Wars. You know. Oh my so God. He, that's what, and and that's when in the late seventies, European actors started to come here to appear in our films, and that's why. So Peter Cushing came to the United States and made. Made a few films in the U.S. Right, right. Uh, before we move on to the next film, I just wanted to jump back to something you said earlier because I think it's important for the listeners to understand it wasn't too long ago. You know, you, you talked about how movies are made in Hollywood, but TV shows are also made in Hollywood. But it wasn't too long ago that people who were in film kind of looked down on television. They were very snobbish. Like, oh, yes. I would never work in television, you know? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting. And once upon a time in Hollywood, the main character, Leonardo DiCaprio, says to Brad Pitt, says, he goes, I don't want to go over and make a tang Western. She said, they're, 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 they're cheap, they're shit, they're, they're, they're ridiculous. He doesn't want to do it because they were thought of as like television. They were thought of as, as just cheap, you know what I mean? And stupid. Right. And that's the way he is. And then, and then he realized he doesn't have any choice, you know what I mean? He's going he's, to he's gonna lose his house, you know what I mean? He's going to lose everything. So he has to go over there. And that that lets him hang on for a few more years, you know. But at the end of the film, he's he probably doesn't have much of a future. You know what I mean? Right. So <laughs> and, I'll go ahead. But 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 that's that's how it plays out. And that I mean, I'm I'm not a huge big fan of Quentin Tarantino. I I didn't like his previous film, which is The Hateful Eight, because it's, it's just people sitting around talking for like three hours. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and and that's not what I go to a movie to see. I want to see action. I want to see something interesting. I don't want to see people talking in their, you know, their. <laughs> it's just a very vulgar film, I thought. Um, uh, but 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 I I did kind of like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for that reason because it you know it, it talked about films and specifically it was obsessed with cult films and people who were involved in cult films and how they got there and how the films were made there and you know what their what their ultimate fate was you know which wasn't very good. I mean, they didn't get killed by the Manson group, but they still, un- a lot of these people ended up being unemployed, you know? Right. And that's what I was going to ask you, and I, I suppose we're getting into spoiler territory. So, folks, if you haven't watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, pause this show right now and go watch okay. it and come back. Because okay. I wanted to ask you, Robert, about the ending of that movie, which it, I understood it. It didn't confuse me, but I know a lot of people who didn't understand it because it's basically all of a sudden the timeline changes and it diverts because the right. Manson family don't end up killing Sharon Tate in that universe. Right. Is that universe? Right. Yeah. Well, that was, I guess what they wanted to do <laughs> to, um, I mean, I didn't know what they were going to do. Um, I just went to see it cause it, you know, uh, I had heard it had cult movie stuff in it and I, I knew some background about it. I, I didn't know how it ended though. And so, yeah, uh, that was just, a so, you know, that was just a, you know, I guess a way to give it like a happy ending, you know, the once upon a time ending, the happy ending, okay? And, okay, that makes sense, yeah. I, I guess they wanted to give it all a happy ending, you know? And, um, you know, otherwise, it, that, what are you going to do? You can't make the movie if you don't. Otherwise, it's going to be like, you know, they may, all these other Manson movies, uh, you know, uh, don't have happy endings. And I don't think anybody wanted to see another Charles Manson movie. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, right. So this was, this is the, what I liked about it. And once again, I don't want to give Quentin Tarantino too much praise. Cause I think he's got a big head to a certain extent <laughs> is that, is that he's, he knows his cult movies. Okay. He really does. Oh he's yeah. Cult, yeah. He, I, I think he's a cult movie historian. He knows them. 
He incorporates them into his films. He shows them at his theater out in Hollywood, the yep. New Beverly. The New Beverly. That's great. Yeah. I, w- I wish I, I wish I lived out there. I'd be, I'd be a regular customer there. You know. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, so I, he shows a lot of interesting foreign films and cult movies out there. He shows them in thirty-five millimeter, which I think is great. You know. And, and what's so, what's really cool is he bought um, him and his his writing partner Roger Avery used right. to work at a video store back when they were like in their early twenties. And when the video store went out of business, he purchased it. So now what the two of them do, they have a podcast and they'll yes. take like two or three VHS tapes on VHS and watch them and then discuss the films on their podcast. And it's really right. fascinating. Right. And I think that's good. I mean, and good, good for him. Good on him. I'm glad that he's doing it. I think that's a healthy thing to do because it's a way of getting people into these cult films by people who know what they're talking about, and they both do know what they're talking about, and who love the films, and getting people, and you know, to listen to them in an entertaining podcast. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, okay? exactly. I mean, I'm not Quentin Tarantino, but you know, I, I, I I've been into these films. I've collected these films. I, I know I worked in the video store too. You know, I worked in the movie theater. I worked in the adult movie theater once. You know what I mean? Oh wow! <laughs> I work, I, I could, we'll do a show about that sometime. You know, maybe. But you know, I I could tell you. That I've worked in all aspects of movies. I've, I've, you know, I've written film scripts. I've done short films. I've done all kinds of things. The thing I like most about movies is just sitting there and watching them and talking about them and writing about them. I, I have blogs about them. I've written about them in books and magazines. You know, I, I, you know, making movies is a whole different thing. He makes movies and he knows about them and he also shows them on the theater and he talks about them on a podcast and he writes film criticism and that's great that's great i'm good for him i'm glad he's doing it that. that's i'm just saying that, that one film i really didn't like and some of his other films i didn't really like but hey i can't like every film that everybody makes you know what i mean exactly exactly no, I, and I, I just oh go ahead i i did like pulp fiction the original pulp fiction yeah. and i like this most recent one and i hope he keeps doing that i hope i mean I hope I want to listen to this podcast of his. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. It's really good. And just one last thing I wanted to say about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is that, as you mentioned, it is chock full from beginning to end of all kinds of pop culture reference, in particular cult movie references. Right. And the one that stood out to me uh, for this show was that I think uh, Sharon Tate, when she goes to the movie theater towards the end of the film, there's a poster for The Mercenary up on right. the wall, which we're going to be talking about in a little right. while. <laughs> right, and, and that's that. I understand that's a Tarantino favorite. Um, not my favorite Carbucci film. Okay, yeah, it's it's very kind of. Uh, I can see why he wanted to make it because it has. It's a really. It's kind of upbeat. It's kind of like a comedy western. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which which and, and as we're going to talk about his later career, he just completely got all in the comedies in the last ten or twenty years of his life. You know, but yeah. I, yeah, that's definitely a cult movie, okay? And and that that movie, I think I think that played the mercenary in the late sixties, played as the drive-in here. It didn't even play in a, a movie theater. Whereas in Los Angeles, that movie would play in a movie theater. Right. Where I live, I, I live in a small town in central New York. We, we didn't get those. We got those type of movies like Italian westerns and uh, sword and sandal and Italian horror films. They played the drive-ins. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's where, that's where I saw them at drive-ins, you know. Yeah. And that's where that's where I got into them. So you know, I got, and then I got into collecting videos. I still have a few. I just got a new VCR because I still have video VHS videos um, that I watch films on. I have DVDs. I have Blu-rays. I can't afford to have a hundred thousand dollar collection of Blu-rays because <laughs> everything's coming out on Blu-ray. They're constantly got. But I, I buy I buy one every once in a while. You know what I can afford. You know? Yeah. I still have laser discs. I have a whole stack of laser discs. Right, and, that, and that, what happened? That that whole thing was like a, a bomb. It bombed out. Yeah, and it's too bad because I used to rent them from a laser disc store. That that was right. all they rented out was laser discs, and you know you can't my play them. my unit, you could go in and I mean you had to get up and flip the disc <laughs> halfway through the movie. Right, and uh, I never got something. To, I remember back in the nineteen nineties when laser discs were out and people were buying them. I remember thinking, you know, I really don't want to get into this because I have a feeling that it's not going to last. You know, I yeah. had a feeling that it was going to disappear. So what I did, I, I kept buying, DV, I kept buying videos and renting them, or sometimes I get them from a, a gray market or but get them at, you know, like a, a Borders or, or a, you know, media player or something like that. All these places which run a business, and then 
when the DVDs came out, DVD came out like in the late nineties, I started to buy DVDs, and then the DVDs really killed the laser disc. Yeah, yeah, and part of it was because they were so big and clunky, and it took a while for them to come out with the DVDs, as I understand it, and I, I could be wrong if someone wants to write in and tell me, or if you want to tell me, but my understanding was that they were doing it with the red laser that you would use on a CD, but because a movie takes up so much more information, the discs had to be huge and had to be double-sided, and once they perfected what was called the blue laser, they were then able to create more manageable sized discs in the form of DVDs. Is is that what right. you heard? And, yeah, and that's and that's where the DVD is. A DVD is a, a well, a Blu-ray is really the blue disc now. Okay, because they they use a blue they use a Blu-ray instead of the red ray and the Blu-ray. And what a Blu-ray is is the it's like a high definition uh, DVD. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a DVD which has a higher definition, usually is sharper picture, better colors. And usually there's more space on it so you can have, like, commentaries or, like, you know, posters right. and everything else. Or, like, uh, I mean, I, I also do – I also work for several film companies like Mondo Macabro and um, occasionally Severn Films, Mondo Macabro. Two of the best film DVD Blu-ray companies out there, they, they, they do mostly Blu-rays now. And once in a while I do audio commentaries for them. I've done some um, – I've, I've done – I just did a recent – Auto commentary on a Jess Franco film, you know, and nice. uh, I've, I've I've done other commentaries on Spanish horror films, Italian horror films, different films, and it, that, that's nice. But you couldn't do that type of thing on a VHS or video, or you couldn't do. Uh, although on the laser disc, I guess that's where the cult commentary thing started. Yes, but what yeah. it is, the DVD is a shrunk down laser disc, and the Blu-ray is a high definition DVD. Right, right. Okay. So let's move on to the next film, Django, from 1966. A century ago on the low hills along the border between the southern states and turbulent Mexico, a mystery man appeared. A man with a sad, impenetrable face. Django! Django! that man what was his secret it's not important and if i bothered you will you accept my apology he was pitiless in revenge quick to decide and a master of every weapon a man everybody would like to have seen dead yeah his name is Django. Django, the title of a film you'll never forget. Django. How many men you got left? Your tongue tied? Or don't want to tell me? <laughs> Too bad, Maria. Django, an audacious man of action, capable of a tender, hopeless love which could only last a day, but a day which was worth all eternity. I'm glad I made you feel like a real woman. Very glad. I mean. Django. A new, ruthless, violent film. Featuring a great new star, Franco Nero, and a great supporting cast.
I, I just wanted to quickly mention about uh, Corbucci's spaghetti westerns. You know, most of his spaghetti westerns were pretty bloody and violent, which is great. Yes. But he also did some of the um, the bloodless Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill movies too. And I we've talked about a lot of those over on the East Meets the West. I, I love uh, Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer. Right. They made a series of now. There's a story behind that. They made a series of comedy westerns. Okay. Yeah. And, and I've seen one or two of them. They were pretty good, but they weren't really my cup of tea. Okay. But some people love. They made a lot of them. Okay. Like there's there's one called My Name Is Nobody. Yes, yeah, we covered that. Which is very good, which is serious, which is has comedy in it. It has it has a lot of action in it. And um and um Ernesto Gastaldi, uh, Italian screenwriter who's been around for a long time, is a Facebook friend and a real life friend of mine. He wrote the script for that. He wanted to write he told me and other people that he wanted to write like a, a kind of a serious, you know, uh, uh, film with those guys with, with comedy in it and with uh, Terrence Hill in it, whose yeah. real name I think is Mario something or other. Um, he, he's a, you know, and Henry Fonda of course is in it playing a character, very kind of old time Western hero. You know, yeah, very. Th- that's a very good film. I would recommend that. My name is Nobody. He wrote the script for it. Very well written, very well directed film by Tonina Valerie, who was an assistant director to uh, Sergio Leone, and um, very well. Uh, in fact, I reviewed that film back in the 1970s when I played at the drive-in in a local uh, weekly newspaper, and I said this was a I say this is a great film for you people who remember the old Italian westerns because that was in 1973 when I saw it, and by that time the Italian westerns were going out of business. You know? Done. Yeah, that's one thing we learned on the show on East Meets the West is that um, they started to deconstruct the genre pretty quickly after it became a thing, you know? Right. And that film does deconstruct the genre, but it's pretty good. And I think they made and I think they made too many of the comedy westerns. Now, the comedy westerns, I, I went to Europe. My first trip to Europe was in 1973, okay? Mm-hmm. Boy, those, those Terrence Hill films are all over Paris, okay? Big, gigantic posters, you see. They were in all the movie theaters in Paris. And I, w- I was in Paris. I was in Nice. I was in Belgium and Brussels. Th- those films were huge over there. You, they, they have gigantic posters, like huge, huge, like city block style posters. You know what I mean? Like you know, like may- maybe like you know, fifty feet by twenty five feet over the over the marquee. You know, and you know, Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer. You know, my, yeah, playing uh, what were those characters they play? I can't remember. You know, they, they you know, and, and they would have a comedy drawing up there. People were going to see those all over the place when I was in Europe. They were like every day you see like a line outside the theater. Yeah, yeah, that's they amazing. Were, they, they were huge successes in Europe, even more than the United States. And they're so huge. I just um, probably a year or two ago, I downloaded a little game for my phone called um, Slaps and Beans, and it's based. It's basically uh, Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer, and it's like they whoever made the game licensed their likenesses and made the game about them. <laughs> That's great, and Bud Spencer he was he he was a good he was a good dramatic. Guy. I've I've saw a few, there's a few spaghetti westerns I have where he plays dramatic roles, and he's pretty good as a dramatic actor too. You know, so yeah. he could also do drama, and he's also in a Dario Argento film, um, which he's very good. I can't remember the name. Oh, oh yeah, Four Four Flies on Gray Velvet. But he's oh, he's a yeah. very he's a very good actor. He appeared in serious spaghetti westerns, comedy yeah. westerns. All kinds of interesting stuff. I've been and trying to get, but uh, Terrence Hill on um, on uh, the East meets the West, but our schedules keep crossing because he does a show in Italy where he plays a, um, a priest that solves crimes. Oh, that'd be great! How, yeah. how old is he now? He must be in his eighties, seventies, or eighties. No, right? yeah, I'd have to look that up off the top of my head. I don't know. I think he's yeah, probably in his seventies at least. Right? Yeah, because he's yeah. Cause, now, Bud Spencer died a few years ago, so he's he's gone. Right. Okay, yeah, he's gone. Uh, but. That'd be great if we got him. Great to if we ever get him on, I would like to be on that show because <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Tell me about. It. I, I, I have a bunch of questions I'd like to ask him, especially about that one film. My name is Nobody. I think that's one of the best spaghetti westerns outside of the Corbucci ones and the Leone films. Right, right. And that was cause that was. And I said in the review, I said years ago, I said this is kind of the last spaghetti western, and I, I think that was the last spaghetti western I saw in a movie theater too. You know? hmm. It was at a drive-in, and. Uh, but at that time, I really didn't know who Sergio Corbucci was back in the 70s, you know? Right, right. And, um, and uh, Django never showed here. Oh, it didn't? Going into Django now. 
Now, this is an interesting story. Let me just tell you a little bit about Django. Um, well, Jan well, Django, Django did show up here actually, but it did, it didn't. Django and the Great Silence, the Great Silence, which is really, I think, a masterpiece and probably Corbucci's best film by far. That did not show here. Huh. Okay. Daryl F. Zanuck, Hollywood producer, head of 20th Century Fox, was 20th Century Fox bought that film and was going to distribute it internationally. Daryl F. Zanuck was the head of 20th Century Fox. When he saw that film, the, 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 it was so violent and the ending was so upsetting and he didn't like the political aspect of the film. It so disturbed him that he said, this film is never going to be released in America. So he made sure that film was not released in America, that his studio, it was not released theatrically in America. Um, this was, and this I'm talking about a great, great film, never released in America. It wasn't released in the UK. It was banned over there for violence. And it was released in a lot of third world countries, uh, other countries where it did very well. Django did very well in um, third world countries because it showed like this hero killing the villains who were kind of like racist villains, you know what I mean? We're killing yeah. Mexicans. Yeah. And, and Corbucci's films were always on the side of the the kind of the peasants or the exploited and the good guys are like the, you know, the kind of the um, the uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kind of corrupt businessmen, you know? So in, in both in Django and in The Great Silence which we're going to talk about. and uh, But that film received, I believe, a very limited, if, you know, theatrical showing in the U.S., if it was even released here at all. And it was very violent. Oh, yeah, Django set a new uh, a new level of violence for these Right, I, I, mean, I mean, hundreds of people are killed in that film, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I mean, uh, what's it? Franco Nero has a mach machine gun. We, we're just machine gunning people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, and you can, you can watch it as like a kid or a kid and laugh at it, but I mean, I don't even know if that kind of film could be, could be made nowadays, you know? Right. It, it was very violent, very very grotesque, macabre, like they're cutting people's ears off, they're cutting people, they're cutting people's fingers off, they're cutting, you know, they're torturing people in very bloody ways. And so, yeah, these... Daryl F. Zanuck, though, who produced The Longest, a very famous Hollywood producer, wouldn't let this film be released in the United States. He was very influential in Hollywood since the 1940s and 30s. Like, he produced, like, um, you know, John Ford's and Grapes of Wrath and things like that. Right. Very, very respected producer. He was he was still in charge of 20th Century Fox. He was old, older, very conservative guy. He said, we're not going to release this film in the United States. He said, this is too violent. We're not going to release it. Now that's interesting that you said that because um, well Django came out in ninety seven, but prior to our show tonight, our recording, I went and looked at my computer because I do uh, um, on Facebook. I have a page where I have uh, I post TV guide scans and newspaper movie ads that well, I, well, well, I research. Yeah, just one thing we're talking, we're talking about the the Great Silence. That's oh the oh okay because yeah because I have a listing for Django um, from a theater called the Tropical. Which I'm not sure. It's the Valley Morning Star is the newspaper, so I'm not sure where that was located. But okay, so Great Silence was never. Yeah, that makes sense because I. The Great Silence. Yeah. Was not released in the U.S. We're going to talk about that some more. And um, Daryl F. Zanuck saw the film, was horrified by the film, and would not release it here in the U.S. Right. Because his company was 20th Century Fox, and it was not released in other countries too. It was banned and not released there for reasons of violence. Okay. Now Django was a year before was two years before that, 1966. Um, that received a limited release, I believe, but didn't do very well in the U.S. It wasn't a big hit like it was. It was a huge hit around the world, but not in the U.S. Right. Now, where, where did you see this ad? Was You said it was in 1967? It's uh, 69. Hold on, let me click on it again here. It's from 19, It's from a newspaper called the, um, the Valley Morning Star. So I'm not 100% sure where that is. I'd have to do a little research on that. Um, but yeah, the, it's just it's just listed as playing at a movie theater called the Tropical. Okay, it, it's probably it sounds like it might be in California. Okay, it's played with uh, Wanted Johnny Texas is the first film. It's a double bill. <laughs> it says not recommended for children. <laughs> okay, so, so it's showing as it's showing as it's showing as the bottom half of a double bill several years after it was ma released. Huh? Yeah, two years at least. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it was made in '66. Played all over the world. It was a big hit. So you're seeing an ad from three years later, and it's a double, about half a double bill. I don't think it. I don't think it received a wide 
release in 66 or 67, right when it was new. And I, if it did, I don't think it did very well, as your as this ad indicates. But you no, know, but the, the great silence, Corbucci's masterpiece, which I really can't wait to talk about, was not released in the U.S. because it was hated by Daryl Zanuck. And also Clint Eastwood bought the rights to it because he wanted to do a remake of it, a less violent remake of it, okay? That's another backstory, okay? A lot of hmm. people don't know that. And he did try to make a remake of it like in the 70s, which we'll talk about, okay? And so so that was another thing. It wasn't released in the U.S. And we're talking once again about the great silence, okay? Right. Um, wasn't released in the U.S. Daryl Zanuck wouldn't release it. Clint Eastwood bought the rights to it, tried to remake it as an unsuc- one, of, one of his few unsu- lesser successful films. So Django, yeah, it, apparently got some play dates, as you just noted. It did not do well in the U.S. It, it was a huge hit, like in third world countries, okay? Yeah. And uh, Corbucci would, became was famous. It was got got good reviews, um, but not in the U.S. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting how how those things kind of work, you know. But yeah, it's it's Django is just there's so many things to love about that movie. I really, really love Django. I mean, you know, opens with Franco Nero dragging around this coffin, and for most of the film, you're like, why is he dragging this coffin around with him? <laughs> right, right. And then you find out why he's dragging the coffin. Right. Around, right? Right, because it's got like a machine gun in it. He's going to kill people. Okay, <laughs> and, and that's what's great about the film. It has all these, uh, has all these cool surprises in it. You know, and you know that's one thing I noticed about Franco Nero in some of his later spaghetti westerns is he loves his machine guns. Yes, you know, <laughs> right. And also, you got to remember Franco Franco Nero speaks speaks English. Okay, he he yes. taught himself. He taught himself English. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a backstory about how Django was made, okay? So they got Django, they got this film script, okay, by Sergio Corbucci and several other people. And then they said this guy, Franco Nero, was in a few films he appeared in. Not a big star in Italy, but he was well known, but not a big, not a big international star. Um, he, 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 he learned English at that point so he could appear in Camelot, okay? The movie, the hit movie Camelot, yeah. okay? In the U.S. Now, what year was that? 19, did that come out? 66 or 67? Some Somewhere on there, yeah. Okay. He learned English so he could appear in this movie in the U.S. where he played um, Sir Lancelot, I believe. And, and, um, with Richard Harris, right? With Richard Harris. Yeah. Vanessa Redgrave. That was a huge hit in the U.S. Camelot. I think it was yeah. came out in 66 or 67, maybe. Maybe 67. Yeah, he was uh, Lancelot in, it was 67, yeah. 67. So yeah. Django was made 66. He was, he learned English while that film was being made. Okay. He would study English on the set of the movie. And later when he dubbed his own voice, that was his own voice. Um, no, actually somebody else dubbed his own voice, I think in the original theatrical showings. And, um, he later dubbed his own voice in his other Westerns. Okay. But, uh, he, he had not perfected it yet, but he, like in, um, the mercenary, that's Franco Nero's voice speaking in English, okay? In oh, okay, person, yeah. In Ca- in Campanero is another late, another 1970 Corbucci film. That's Franco Nero's voice. So he taught himself English so he could be, a, so he could be an American star as well as a European star. And he appeared in a number of American movies. But he, he appeared in mainly European movies. But he, 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 was, he could speak English or he could speak Italian perfectly. And um, in any case, when I first saw Django, it was another, somebody else dubbed him. I saw it when it was out on video. And I think, I'm not sure if it was cut or not. It didn't have the impact until I saw a really good DVD of it with um, totally on that. It's it's a really powerful movie. And this guy is just, (laughs) because the main character is just going through all these trials and tribulations. He's being beaten. He's being tortured. He's being robbed. And he just has to fight off uh, the white patriarchy. This, Italian, this Spanish actor um, plays the villain, okay? Eduardo Vizarto, um plays the villain. He's a Spanish actor who played villains in a lot of uh, Italian and Spanish westerns and films. He plays like the villain who's like the, this uh, wealthy white landowner who has like a private army 
who wear like red red hoods over their head. They're like kind of like the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, you know, they like they like uh, torture and kill Mexicans um, instead of African Americans. They kill Mexicans. Okay, yeah. Americans because it's supposed to take place in part of the U.S. Southwestern U.S. and they they like they like hunt they like hunt them down alive and kill them. And the, his character is a real bastard. And, uh, Django wants to kill him and all of his private guys who are in this private army. And you, that's kind of what manages he manages to do that only after a great deal of additional bloodshed, torture, great, great, great deal. Okay, rivers of blood. Okay, yeah. And he's also he's also got these Mexican banditos who are after him because he uses them to get money to you know to get his weapons and he rips them off. And so they, they capture him and they, they mutilate his hands and they beat the shit out of him, basically. I hate to use that <laughs> yeah. kind of language. But uh, and just the beatings go on and on. It's very bloody. He goes through all this and it's just nonstop violence. And, you know, and it, and like I said, he just mows down. He finally breaks and mows down a lot of people at the end. Yeah. Once again, in our society, you know, he'd be considered like a serial killer, I guess. Or, <laughs> I don't know. I thought he was a hero, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back then, he was a hero. You know? yeah. yeah. And one thing I, I think people should know about these films is that you've got Django, but then you've also got Ringo and you've got Sabata. And what ends right. up happening is they made like six, was it 27 sequels to Django? Right. None of which were actual sequels except no. for one in the 1980s. Right. When yeah, he and came I, back. I, yeah, now I've got that one on VHS. Once again, I got it as an old tape. I don't even know if that's on DVD. It probably is by now. And yeah, he's 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 playing Django again, and he's back, and he's fighting another kind of fascistic type of uh, a guy who's got like a slave ship. Okay. Yeah. And he, he's like a slaver, and it's a similar story. And although it's not quite as good as Django, and he, but it's it's twenty years later, but it's it's worth seeing, I think. You know? Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm looking it up right now. But my understanding is that they've got. I mean, he's coming up. He was in um. He's in one of the John Wick movies, and I believe that there. Oh, it doesn't list it here on IMDb, but they're supposed to be. Oh, wait a minute. If I click on that, um. Hmm. I thought I read that they were going to have another. Oh yeah, Django Lives is in production. Right now, right. so he's making a th quote unquote third one. Okay, now who is who is? Uh, is that in Italy or is that in you? Yeah, well, it says Christian Albert is directing. Oh, John Sales is the scriptwriter. Um, that could be good because John Sales is really okay. good. Yeah, John Sales, excellent screenwriter. He's a novelist. He's a, he's directed some amazing films. So yeah, I mean, if he's a, if he's a, if he's attached as a writer, I would definitely see it. You know? Yeah, is yeah. It, is, is that an American film? I don't know. I'm trying to find out. There's not a lot of information on here, and I think it might be in one of those ones in development hell because I've heard about it a while ago. Yeah, it doesn't even give you the production. Uh, right. Because because there was another Django in, in production in like uh, development for years, but it didn't work out. Okay, right. I, I believe that Enzo Casolari also had some. Oh, he had he, he had another role that Nero, Frank Nero played was Kioma. Yes, Enzo yep. Kioma, yep. very good. That's probably one of his best. Yeah. Very violent western. Yeah, that was made in seventy five or seventy. Very violent. He plays this guy. He's tortured, and then finally he gets back at all the bad guys and kills everybody. Very similar story to Django. Enzo Zicasta wanted to make sequels to that for years, but could never get the the financing. Right. So that was another famous, very violent film about a, a bloody adventure. At this time, at this time, Clint Eastwood was making films like The Outlaw Josie Wales, which are kind of very similar, I think, influenced by Django and uh, Kioma. I think Eastwood was very influenced by these films, was trying to make those these films in the American setting where he played the Avenger who overcome great odds and he killed all the bad guys at the end. So that film, I think, was very, when I think one of Eastwood's better films, was very influenced by Django, very similar character. Very similar violence, very similar mood, you know, when you right. agree. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I just looked it up real quick, too. They, um, uh, Django Lives is a United States production, and it's got its own Facebook page. But there's an article about how John Sayles is writing the movie, and it's from 2015. So I have a feeling okay. this thing's in development hell. Okay, so that's seven years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we think John Sayles could get it made, but what you got to have is you got to have a 
a, st- a big star attached to it to make the movies. Like, yeah. like writers and directors, even directors aren't, unless you're Quentin Tarantino now. Right. Because he's, he's, or David Lynch, okay. Um, D- David Lynch, by the way, is one of my favorite, or probably my favorite modern director. And, I mean, everything he does is wonderful, okay? Wonder- yeah. You know, so, I mean, so that's, that there's somebody I do like, you know what I mean? Um, uh, and, and I think Martin Scorsese is another one, you know? But, uh, you know, you, you know, the, these, these guys can make their own films and get them made. You got to have like a big star attached to a project nowadays to get it made. Right. So, right. And probably a lot of these stars don't even know. I mean, J- Tarantino made it, Django Unchained in 2013 or 14. Yeah. And Frank O'Neill had a guest uh, cameo in that. And Frank, Frank O'Neill was in it. Only it's a, only it's a African American Django. Okay. Uh, with an African American plot, it's about an African American uh, gunslinger who's trying to, you know, uh, fight the slavery concept in America and, yeah. you know, free his uh, free his wife who's been enslaved by Leonardo DiCaprio, who's a slave owner. Okay, so it takes place in takes place in uh, basically pre Civil War America, you know, and yeah. uh, pre, pre when slavery was still around. And so, yeah, but he changed the plot, he changed the setting. It's in America. The character of Django is in it because uh, Frank O'Neill is in it. He's wearing white gloves. And uh, he's like, uh, very good to see him in it. But it's a whole different deal. But it's a similar type of story where you have the hero fighting very evil people and using his wits to destroy them. Right, right. So <clears throat> let's move on to The Great Silence here from 1968 because I know you're dying to talk about this movie. Yes. C'è un uomo che fa tremare i cacciatori di taglie quando lo incontrano. Lo chiamano silenzio. Perché dopo che è passato lui, resta soltanto il silenzio e la morte. La tua pistola difende le ingiustizie. Anche mio figlio era innocente. Vendicherai mio figlio e salverai dalla morte tanti altri disgraziati. Chiudi quella porta, ho freddo. Hai sentito? L'altro ha sparato per legittima richiesta. Forse è un buon sistema per uccidere senza che la legge possa farci niente. Vi ho chiesto di venire perché voglio che uccidiate me. Si tratta di Tigrero. Uccido mio marito. Marico! Marco Usuraio! Stai bene lì al caldo, eh? E se vuoi che te l'ammazzi, mettigli un taglio sulla testa. Non dovresti aver bisogno di taglio. Hai tutto l'interesse a ucciderlo. È un nemico di Bounty Kill. Un giorno potreste incontrare uno più svelto di voi. Sarà un giorno molto divertente. Voglio che silenzio venga qui. Se riuscirà ad uccidermi, voi tutti sarete sani. Uh, it's basically, just to let people know the plot, it's a mute gunfighter defends a young widow and a group of outlaws against a gang of bounty hunters in the winter of 1898. Right. So. Yes. Now, I hadn't seen that film. Like I said, it didn't play in America. I don't even, it was even kind of hard to find on videotape back in the 80s and 90s. And then I saw it finally on DVD about 25 years ago when I started to get this getting into DVD. And it's a great film, you know. It's like, uh, hey, uh, you can't go wrong with Klaus Kinski in a supporting right. role, you know. Well, yeah, Klaus Kinski <laughs> plays the most vicious villain of all time. You yeah, know? I mean, he's really a bad. You, you want to see? You, you, you want to kind of reach out and do something bad to him? You know, it's like yeah, because he, he's a horrible <laughs> character. He's a horrible villain who's a who's he's a bounty hunter. Now, by this time, by this time, when you're making these films, like the Clint Eastwood films, we're going to some history here. The Clint Eastwood Italian Westerns. Clint Eastwood was a bounty hunter and he's all these films. The big Sergio Leone films. He's of Kiro. He's the bounty hunter. He kills people and collects them. Then he moves on to the other film. He kills more people. Leave back leaves in the follow up, you know, for a few dollars more. And then the good, the bad, and the ugly. Clint Eastwood was still a bounty hunter. He captures Tuco, Eli Wallach, who's a Mexican bandit, and they kind of 
get their bounty and then they cheat the sheriff out of it and they escape to do another kind of, you know, a scam. And Lee Van Cleef is like kind of like this union officer who's kind of like uh, just out to kill everybody, you know? And, right. uh, and so, the, but in those Sergio Leone films, they're all classic films now, the bounty hunters are the, are the protagonists, are the heroes. Now, what The Great Silence does, it turns over everything, changes everything about that. Complete paradigm shift. The bounty hunters are the, the villains again. They're terrible people. They torture, they kidnap women, they kill uh, elderly people, they kill women, they kill children, they torture them, they, they blackmail people, they tell people they're going to take them in to be tried, but they shoot them in the back at the last minute. They're, they're really evil people, you know? And Klaus Kinski, yeah. and Klaus Kinski plays this very polite leader of all these bounty hunters. He'll like say, have a nice day, and then he'll kill you. you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've seen the film, but oh, he's, yeah, yeah. But he's constantly, he's, he goes out of his way to be polite. He says, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Um, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, I hope you, I hope you didn't fall and hurt yourself. He's very, he's very polite, but he's a monster. Yeah. And that's what's really, that's what's brilliant about his, he plays this very polite, nice guy that looks like a nice guy, but he's a kill, he's a cold blooded killer. So great performance. He really makes the film because you gotta have a, you gotta have a strong villain. And the, 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 the protagonist, Jean Louis Trintignant, very, just died recently, very well known, very respected European actor, didn't speak English. Okay. When yeah. he made that film. So they, they have him, so he's like become a mute. The bounty hunters cut his throat as a child when they were killing his family and they made him into a mute. So the, they did that on purpose, uh, made him a mute in the screenplay because the only actors they could get were actors who didn't speak English, okay, at that time, okay? Because Clint Eastwood was no longer making films in Europe. He, he came back to appear in like Dirty Harry type films. Right. But, in, or Hang Him High. And that film was made in 68. And so the guy didn't speak English, the actor, so they made him into a mute. And that's what makes the film work. He, he plays a mute. He doesn't have any dialogue. And he, he just stands up for what's right. He kills the bounty hunters. And he's a crack shot. He's kind of a mythic figure, you know. And uh, it's great to see these two polar opposites, like, fight it out through the entire film. I'm not going to give away the ending. But they, they just kind of fight it out till the bitter end, you know. And the yes. thing that makes it great, like you mentioned, it's the fact that he doesn't talk. I mean, I almost liken it to the fact that the, the phony shark in Jaws didn't work, so it actually made the movie better because you don't see the, the shark really until the end. Right, right. And that's what's, and, good. And that's, that, that's what's good about that's what, that's what's good about Jaws, that they, they couldn't show it because it looked just too fake. Right. And then and, when, you finally do, when you finally do see it, you just see parts of it. And you say, oh, my God, it, it's, it's huge. You know and what I mean? Rather than have, um, what's his name, Jean-Louis Trintillon, uh, speaking, trying to speak broken English or doing like a Bela Lugosi and phonetically pronouncing everything, right. they have him not speak through the whole movie. And his, all his acting is in his, his, um, you know, his facial expressions and his mannerisms. And I love that about this movie. Yeah, that, that, that's what's so great about it. And you never know what he's going to do next, you know. And he's, 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 got, he's got that mouth or piss. That, that that gun he's got was yeah. It's it's called a seven a seven point three three Mauser, I believe. Yeah, it wouldn't handle that gun was an actually historically correct gun. That was that was only came out a few years in the late eighteen nineties, a few years before the action of the film. So that was the kind of gun that somebody like a bounty hunter or a sheriff would have. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it's a very quick. It's it's got a high, it's got like a it can hold a lot of ammunition more than a six shooter, and it's got a very Rapid, you know, you know, you know. It's, it's basically you can hold a full metal jacket, and it's got like a high rate of fire. Okay, right. You can sh you can shoot like ten or twelve bullets like in two or three seconds. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and that's what he does with the film. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the people he shoots are people you really want to see get shot. You know. Yeah. They're, they're, they're real bastards who are doing terrible things to people. Okay? Yeah. One of these days, I want to cover this movie in, in greater detail over on the East Meets the West, so we'll have to have you on for that one. Oh, I would love to be on it. Well, I've, I, and I've counted, and I've done some research on it. There, there are 80-something 80 80 something kills in the movie, okay? Wow. And, and the film is a 100-minute film. So that's like, that's like, you know, that's like, a, that's, like, that's like about a person a minute right. who gets killed in the film. You know what I mean? Think about yeah. it. It's like 100-something, 100 100 100 and change. And is that minute. more than Django? 
Yeah, I think Django actually more people get killed. Okay. Oh, okay. But 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 but, but the, in the great in this great silence, the the way they get killed is bloodier. And that's actually bloodier, than Django. Yeah. And, yeah. And in the in this in in the scenes, the way they're staged and done are just kind of leave you kind of breathless. It's kind of very it's staged in a very uh, theater of cruelty type ma- manner. Like that's the only thing I can or sadistic <laughs> manner. These people are sadists, you know, and he has to resort to their way of life and killing to to kill them first you know because they're they're the kind of people who shouldn't <laughs> they're the kind of people who are never going to get justice done you, get, you know and, and that's the way you feel about them you don't really you're not sad when he's when they're being killed you feel like hey good good <laughs> right right um it is on a couple of streaming services it's on something called hoopla i don't i don't know if that's free or not or film movement um, but you can also get it for like three bucks on Amazon and YouTube. So right. I definitely recommend people check out The Great Silence. It's just such a great right. movie. Yeah, if you, if you want to come away from this and your recommendation, that, that's a great movie. Once again, the acting is superb. The script is superb. The, it was In this film, we were talking about where these Italian westerns were filmed in Spain, like Django was filmed in Spain, and The yeah. Mercenary was filmed in Spain, where it's dusty and hot and dusty. This was all filmed in northern Italy, in Cortina, which is like in the mountains where it's snowing all the time, and the interiors are filmed in Rome. None of this was filmed in Spain, so it has a totally different look. And the first thing you see in the movie is just the screen is whited out, and you see him, um, the silence, the character of silence, just riding a horse as a speck coming out of the, the snowstorm, you know? Yeah. And it's a very, very effective opening shot, you know? And um, he's like uh, death incarnate, you know? But, you know... He's like the good death, and then there's the bad death with Kinski, you know? Right, right. <laughs> and, and, and that's what you're seeing play out through the film. It's got a great score by Ennio Morricone. Yeah. Okay? Very dramatic score, okay? Um, which is really very gripping score. Great script, great score, great photography, great location. Oh, great, yeah. great film. It's probably one of my, it's probably, uh, I think, once upon a time in the West and, and the Good, the Bad, and Ugly, and the Great Sound, those, those are probably my sweet favorites. Italian westerns. Yeah, I, thank God I have them all on, you know, very nice DVDs and Blu-rays. You know? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and those are the, I mean, if you know, I mean, there was a time I was I was running for an Italian western magazine, and I saw a lot of Italian westerns. And after a while, I kind of got sick of them and said, okay, I don't want to see any more Italian westerns. Right. But those are those are three I can watch over and over again, and you can enjoy them each time. They're they're just good movies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's move on. Our next and final film that we're going to talk about today is called The Mercenary from 1968, also starring uh, Franco Nero, and it's also got Jack Palance in it, too. Right. sell your life for what he thinks it's worth. He is the mercenary. If you're not ready to buy, be ready to die. The mercenary. His gun does the rest. Franco Nero. Tony Musanti. Jack Balance. Giovanna Rabbi. The mercenary. The sun at his back. A gun at his side. A town at his mercy. Now, that was made, I believe, right after the Great Silence. And once again, Corbucci 
went back to Spain, and that was from mainly, you know, the rain in Spain, like mainly on the plains type deal. You know, it's like that was filmed in the hot deserts of Spain, Almeria, Spain, which is in southern Spain. And you got like, um, it's, it's all takes place in these desert locations. The architecture looks Spanish. It looks like, it looks like Mexico. And it takes place though in the early 20th century because there's a biplane in it and it takes place during the Mexican Revolution. Right. Which I which believe had, went from 1910 to 1920. Right. So it takes place sometime after 1910. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's when, um, Sam Peck applies the Wild Bunch, which is probably my, which is another great Western, oh, yeah. great, great film. Um, that all takes place during World War One. During, you know, they say they say in the film that yeah, they have planes over there in that war in Europe now. So that that takes place in that takes place like in 1914, 1915, where they had cars in there, yep. they have planes, they have automatic weapons. You know, they have a lot a lot more efficient ways of killing people in that film. And in that film, that's the most violent Western ever made. Probably that that, that does. That goes way beyond Corbucci, you know, and I, th- I think the Wild Bunch was very much influenced by Corbucci's Django and The Great Silence, you know. Yeah, it, it has that same feeling of you know, like uh, you know, uh, good versus evil, and just a few people having to you know deal with like overwhelming force, you know. <laughs> yeah, I will say this though: the um, we covered this, like I, I said, on um, These Meets the West, and we also um, at a later point covered this um companion film to this. It's not really a sequel. It's called The Compañeros. Right. Um, another Corbucci film. I liked the Com- Compañeros better. I felt like the pacing in this movie was really slow. Right. And uh, Franco Nero's character, I, he he plays uh, Sergei Kowalski, who's also called, referred to as the Polak because he's Polish. The Polak, right. We, we don't want to say any ethnic slurs. So okay. Oh, but, well, whatever. That's but, what they but, call him in the but, movie. So. But they call... See, that. I don't even know if that would be in a movie today because of that. Right. You know, you know Paul... I know a lot of Polish people, really nice people. I don't, you don't want to, you don't want to call them Polak. You know what I mean? but, but, <laughs> no, but, but the but, point the people but, have but, to... but those, those characters would do it in that film. So Kowalski is the mercenary. He's the main character. Right. And, and people also, though, have to not get upset about old movies. You have to take them yes, in the context right. of when they were made. That's what right. they called him in this film. I'm not right. using it as a racial slur. Right. That was his character's name. Right. I'm just saying that somebody <laughs> t- today, if that was shown, I'm sure there's some audience who would think it was a racist story. Right, you know? right. Yeah, so I just felt like the pacing was too slow in this one. I didn't care about Franco Nero's character that much. Um, Jack Palance was great, um, but it's. I, I did actually end up watching it twice, and I liked it better on the second viewing. Um, but I, I just felt like, and, and both of them are in the Compañeros. I felt like Compañeros was a superior film. I mean, would you? What do you think of that opinion? Yeah, no, I, I kind of agree with you. Okay, because. Uh, I was on a spaghetti Western board years ago on, on the internet before Facebook where we t- I was running for a magazine that one of the people there, Tom Betts, kind of the, Tom Betts is kind of the uh, authority on spaghetti Westerns, American authority on spaghetti Westerns. This guy is like a brilliant, he knows, he knows, he knows it all. He, he ran the board. He was the sheriff of the board. And, but everybody would be talking on this, on this, on this internet board about, you know, how, the Mercenary was a great film, but Compañeros wasn't as good. I was exactly the opposite. I thought Compañeros, which was made in 1970, a year or two later, was a much better film. It, it was the same. It was almost the same film. It has the same story about Franco Nero plays like a mercenary who's selling weapons, and then there's Thomas Millian is in that. Yeah. Who plays who plays like the Mexican, the kind of ignorant Mexican bandit, who's like uh, depends on him to get the weapons. And at the end, he kind of wins him over to get the mercenary. In other words, is is just selling weapons. Um, but he, at the end, he he kind of joins their cause, you know, because he sees the Mexican government is corrupt and needs to be overthrown. You know? And they're so, also and, coming over the hill and about to kill him, so he joins the revolution. <laughs> right, and, and at the end, you don't see what it's kind of open ending. But yeah, you know, all, all the characters who you really kind of get attached to, like Thomas Millian, the bandit, yeah. who's kind of like a interesting kind of almost lovable character, you know, kind of like a, and then Frank O'Nero, um, they're all going to get killed at the end, but you don't see it, you know? Yeah. And so it, it, it's, yeah, I think it's a much better take on the same topic. I think it was a much better script. It was, it seemed like it was more thought out and, and there was some comedy in it, some funny stuff, but it didn't go on for, it didn't go on for a long time. You know, mm. I thought the comedy and the mercenary clashed 
the serious stuff. And it kind of went, it was kind of went on for too long. You know? Right. Right. And it, uh, so, so I thought the Compañeros was a better film, same characters, same story, same location, Mexican revolution at that time. But I think it was a little bit better done. And uh, I thought the music was a little, I thought the, the music was better too. I think it was any Warricone again, yeah. but in, in uh, the mercenaries kind of like that, you know, that, that, Familiar Mexican music like that, uh, Mexican music you hear like a carnivals and, and whistling. And I didn't like the music as much. I think, I think Morricone's score was, or it was either Morricone or Bruno Nicolai. The score for Campaneros was better. The photography was better. The direction was better. Is, is and that's, this, it, well, I was just going to say, is this the one where there was a, a fist fight that breaks out and all of a sudden a parade comes marching through? Or, or am I thinking of a different movie? I, I, you know, I don't know that. I haven't seen. I haven't seen Campaneros in a long time. I've got that in the Spaghetti Western box set, released by Blue Underground, which I highly recommend, which has Django, um, this, it has Django, it has Campaneros, and it has um, a Django Kill with Thomas Millian, which is not a real Django film, but right. it's, kind of one of the, it's kind of one of the better, you know, um, unofficial Django films. And it's got the Menage on it, The Man Called Blade, Okay. Four pretty good Spidey Westerns, but I haven't I haven't seen it like in fifteen or twenty years. Okay, but I remember it being I remember liking it a lot. And then when I finally saw the Mercenary years later, I said, "Now nah, this is this is kind of the same story, but it's not as gripping or as well done or as well, or as well acted." And Jack Palance plays Cur- Curly. He's got curly hair. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he, play, he plays kind of like a cliched you know villain. And I've seen Jack Palance play that type of role in a lot of different films. I believe I believe Jack Palance is also in. Campaneros, isn't he? Yes, yep, he's in that one. And it's funny because in the movie City Slickers, he's also called Curly in that movie. Oh, really? Okay, right. Yeah. He 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 really won deserved the Academy Award. He won for that. I'll tell you that. Yeah, because he was he was really a good character actor and villain in many many films. No, he's he's one of those actors. Would you say he was sort of the exception to the rule? Because we talked about a lot of these guys that their career started to tank over here, and they went over and became stars in Europe for a while. But he's career was going pretty good he went over there and became you know worked quite a bit and then came back here like there was no break i don't yeah, i don't think you're right. in his career you're right cuz he came back over here and he still was in a lot of he he was still he still got lots of prominent roles in successful american films yes he yeah. did he didn't he got he, he right up until like right right up until city slickers like that was made in the 1990s so that was like 25 years later he was still getting Important character roles, villain roles, important roles, and he won the Academy Award. Yeah, <laughs> best, yeah. Best supporting. And he, he got up and did one-handed push-ups, and the man. Yeah, I remember. The man had, had only had, one lung. <laughs> right, right. He had one lung. He had black lung disease because he was in. He worked in the mines, and like Charles Bronson, he worked in the mines when he was a kid of Pennsylvania. You know? Oh yeah. And he was um, also he used to do push-ups on the set of his films. I've talked to some people who worked on films in, in Europe, and they said that he used to do that between takes. You know. Yeah. He used to like do push ups to intimidate people or say show that he was still, you know, a tough guy. And this was back in the late sixties, okay? I mean, he had already been in films for twenty years. He'd been in films throughout the nineteen fifties. I mean, remember Shane yep. played yep. The, the, the the killer in that. He's I mean, that's what that's one of the that that might be his greatest villain role because he's got the black glove he puts on, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean he he already had that villain role mastered in Shane back in the early 50s, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's great in that, you know? He's also in Attack, you know? You know, the, the war movie, great in that. He's, oh, he's right, so many, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So many great movies he appeared in the U.S. And film, a lot of film noir type movies he was in. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, he came back and he still got roles. And so to say, throughout the 1970s, he had, he played like in um, horror movies. He was in comedies. He was in, still played villains. And then, like I said, City Slickers, he got the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Very much deserved. But I, I just watched, uh, on, um, I, get, I, I see a lot of older European films, too, on uh, some of these YouTube channels or some channels. I just watched an old film of his made in the 1960s called, uh, uh, it's called Craze. He plays an antique dealer, crazy antique dealer who's killing people because he worships his African God, God, okay, and it's it's really a neat little movie, and he plays a total villain and a killer, crazed killer, 
but you really believe them. And that was made like, I think, in 1969. No, no, that was made in the mid-70s. That was made in 73 or 74. Huh. And he, he was, he's excellent playing this kind of crazy antique dealer. It, it was filmed in London. Oh, yeah, 74. 74. He's great in it. And it's on, I think it's on YouTube and some other channel. Oh, it's on Tubi. Tubi, yeah. Yeah. And that's where I watch it. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen it, watch it. You'll love it. I got to add this to my list because the, the, the plot is a nutty antiques dealer starts to sacrifice women to an African idol. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That, and that's the whole plot. That's all it is. The whole film takes place in his antique shop. And he, like, he like talks to the idol, you know. He like, it looks, it looks, it looks like one of these tiki type gods. He looks, he's like saying, yes, master, I will go out and kill them. And But he, he, he goes out and picks up women in clubs. You know what I mean? And then yeah. they'll like, take them out for a date. Then they'll go back to his apartment. And he'll kill him, you know, and he'll, then he'll like throw the body, body in the river, the Thames River or in a swamp in England somewhere, you know. Oh, and Freddie Francis directed it. Wow. Yeah, F- Freddie Francis, one of my favorite kind of European horror directors. Yeah. Great I- job of directing, too, he did. It's very taut. It's, it's got very, it's all filmed in like, the way it's filmed is very interesting. It's all filmed with these point of view shots where you just see him over the, over the victims, you know. Yeah. And he doesn't really, he doesn't really, it's that bloody, but it's very well done. And and Jack Palance is in another one of Freddie Francis's horror films. It's called Torture Garden. That's yes, I think it I have that on DVD. Written by Robert Block, yep. who wrote who wrote Psycho. Who wrote the he wrote the book The Psycho, the movie Psycho was based on. Yeah, Robert Block was a very prolific screenwriter and novelist uh, with horror and science fiction. He wrote scripts for The Twilight Zone and for Night Gallery. And he wrote, he wrote this other Freddie Francis film called Torture Garden. And Jack, it's like five horror stories, short stories. And Jack Palance is in the last one. And he plays a collector of Edgar Allan Poe memorabilia. Right. Kind of, uh, his kind of goal is to uh, make Edgar Allan Poe arise from the dead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a really good, it's only less like 20 minutes, it's a really good 20 minutes short. Horror story, but it's excellent. Jack Palance is just superb in it because you can see you can see he's really unhinged. He's like it's like it's kind of like a a commentary on people who collect things. You know, who can go crazy right. by just wanting to collect things, and they want to they want to have the best collection there is. You know. Oh yeah, I, I remember when I was a kid, my mother and I would stay up late on Fridays and Saturdays and watch the scary movies, and that was one of them. I never forgot that film, especially with Burgess Meredith sort of being the, the right. wraparound host for the film. Right you know? now, and Burgess Meredith is great. It's got a really good cast too, and Burgess Meredith, another excellent American character yep. actor. Peter Cushing, and Jack, and, and yeah, Jack Palance is in it. Peter Cushing's in it. Yeah, it's got a great cast, you know. It's um, and uh, so yeah, Palance. He, he was good in those things, still getting roles in Europe, came back and got roles in America. Plus, he had he was on te- he had television series in the 70s and 80s. He had like, um, I can't remember, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yes, I yep. He was the host of that. So he was he he remained a very successful actor right up until his, his death. He would so, always yeah, his, do the story and he'd go, believe it or not. Or not, right. <laughs> That's a very good Jack Palance. Oh, thank you. <laughs> imitation, by the way, Rigo. Very excellent uh, but yeah, he was, he managed to go over and appear in these films, including Sergio Corbucci films, Hammer films, Freddie Francis films, um, horror films over there, uh, westerns over there. He appeared in short and sandal films. He played Genghis Khan, I believe, in one film. Yep. And then, and then he, he appeared in the, the Mongols is another film that was made over there. And, uh, He's very good as that, it's, it's, and you really you really believe him as that type of character. Right. His, his face looks like that type of you know Mongol type character. They, they made him up with a Fu Manchu mustache. Right. So yeah, his career didn't tank after that. His career, he had a long career, successful career. Right. Right. So I had a question for you, and this is we're, we're kind of off on a tangent a little bit here. We'll bring it back in soon, but um, would you say that Freddie Francis is to Terrence Fisher? As Sergio Corbucci is to Sergio Leone. Yeah, that's a very good comparison. I definitely think so. Right, like like Sergio Leone. Yeah, like like one's kind of like the classicist, and one's kind of like the modernist. I guess you would say. You know. Yeah. It, it, it's it's it, it's like one guy's kind of like Michelangelo, and the other guy's kind of like a very good sculptor of the same era who you don't know as well, but still did good stuff. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Like 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 everybody can't be the great 
You know, everybody can't be the greatest director who ever lived. You know what I mean? Right, and right. You, yeah, but that's a very good comparison. That, that's very good. And Freddie Francis made a lot of good films. He made Tales from the Crypt, another good anthology. Tales of Witness Madness is another favorite. Yep. Went on the, he made a whole series of these anthology films. Yeah. And he made um, The Creeping Flesh, which is very good, too. Which yep. is a, he was a cinematographer also. He did the camera work for The Innocence, classic British horror film. And then oh, he right. became a then he became a cinematographer who worked with David Lynch. He was a cinematographer on The Elephant Man. I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. Freddie Francis he did the black and white cinematography in the in the nineteen eighties. He, he his directing career had kind of slowed down, and he wanted he actually wanted to get back into camera work because I guess he liked doing that more because he didn't have so much responsibility. You know, right? He just right. he just he just liked doing kind of you know neat camera work. So he became David Lynch's cameraman for uh, the Elephant Man. That's one of the that's the black and white cinematography is just great in that. Yeah, yeah, that's and, amazing. And Freddie Francis won two Academy Awards for Best Cinematographer. One, one was for um, a British film, older British film, I can't remember which. I think it was a D. H. Lawrence film, and the second one was for Glory, the American Civil War film in the nineteen eighties. Oh yeah, so with he, Matthew Broderick and uh, Denzel right. Washington. That was shot by Freddie Francis when he. Came to American, because it was really a second career he had as a cinematographer after he kind of retired from directing. He won a second Academy Award for that, and that's that's a great looking film. That's insane, and uh, it's, it's a good. I mean, his cinema he was a superb cinematographer yeah. as well as director. He also photographed David Lynch's Dune, which which I thought was very good. A lot of people didn't like. It. I thought it was. Yeah, I, I thought it was really good. Yeah, I thought it was really good. I'd like to get the uncut version. So I didn't see the new one because I liked the old one so much. But in any case, Freddie Francis was a cinematographer on several David Lynch films. Wow, I did not know that. That's incredible. Yeah. So that's another story to go with. But in any case, <laughs> yeah, going back to the Corbucci, yes, I would agree that um, The Mercenary is, is kind of worth seeing maybe once. For me, it had like some of the comedy that I didn't get into that much. I thought it was kind of stupid slapstick. And also, it, it didn't really, it wasn't as well developed as a story or as a realistic depiction, I think, of the revolution, what was happening down there with the Mexicans and the Americans and the Europeans getting involved. I think Capaneros was much better written and cast and developed. And also, Thomas Millian, who's a great, great spaghetti Western character actor, and other yes. yeah. was, was better, was better than the guy, Tony Musante, who was in, he was a better actor and more convicted. He was a real, he was a real, he was from Cuba, but he was a real Latino type guy, whereas the guy who was in uh, Mercenary was just like a, I think he was an Italian-American. He wasn't really a right. Mexican. Right. He didn't really, he wasn't as convincing as, as the Mexican bandit. Yeah, yeah. So I totally agree with you. We're both on the same page. Campaneros is the best version of that same story. Uh, it was a better film about the revolution. I would recommend that over him. Mercenary, and that was really Sergio Corbucci's last, for me, good film. Now, after that, just to wrap up, he spent the rest of his, he, he made a few more westerns. Between 1964 and 1975, he ended up making 13 westerns, okay? Yeah. Um, and two or three of them, two or three of them were great, I would say. Uh, the ones to see are The Great Silence, Django, um, both excellent westerns, Campaneros, and Minnesota Clay was a very good one. Um, he made three. He made he made two or three really top notch ones. So um, out of thirteen, he made other Italian westerns which weren't quite as good. He made uh, he got into making a lot of comedies. He made several films with Terrence Hill yeah. comedies that weren't even westerns. He made a film with Terrence Hill and Ernest Borgnine in 1980 called Super Fuzz. Okay, yeah, which was a cop <laughs> comedy. That was, by, that was directed by, I didn't even realize, by that time I knew who Sergio, Sergio Cabucci was. Right. I remember seeing ads for it in Variety and thinking, what the hell is he doing, doing direct this type of film? But <laughs> it, it, was, it was a Terrence Hill, Ernest Borgnine comedy. And um, I, I guess I remember reading some reviews where it wasn't that good. And then he made even more comedies and um, some musicals. And that was the end of his career. He spent the last 20 years of his life uh, making kind of comedies and musicals and lighthearted films. <laughs> right, right. They were more, they were more easygoing, you know, more mainstream. 
that were popular in Italy and Peru. They were more mainstream type films. Right. They weren't right. these violent. They weren't these violent, bleak westerns with a, maybe a message or a twist to them. Right. So that, that was kind of the end of his career. Right. <laughs> so of of the five films we talked about today, three of which were westerns, um, one was a kind of a Euro spy, and one was a peplum film. Of these five, Robert, if you had to choose, if you were forced to pick one, would there be one that would be your favorite? Yeah, the the, the Great Silence, obviously. Yeah, I and and, and then Django, after, number two, a close second. Yeah, the, 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 like I said, he made a lot of films. Like I said before, he became before he before he became well known with the sword and sandal films, with the Goliath films, and and and, and, and the westerns. And in the fifties, he made a lot of. He, I've seen several of those films are. They're kind of like comedies or, or love few love stories. They're, they're more family oriented films. Some musicals, and his later films were just more musicals, more comedies. He he was really hot and big between 1960 and 1970. That's when he that was his great decade. I think. Right, right, yeah, and I agree. I absolutely agree with your assessment. Great Silence is is awesome. Django is just almost on the same tier. Um, I think I've seen Django far more than I've seen The Great Silence. I've only seen that once or twice. So I have to watch that again. Right, um, that's worth having. That's actually worth having on Blu-ray. If they have, I, I guess they released a new Blu-ray of it. You know, and uh, I mean that's that's a film which I would actually double dip for. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and there was another Corbucci film I wanted to mention just before we sign off here. Um, that uh, he was a uh, Corbucci. Sergio Corbucci died at the age of sixty-three, so he was. He was fairly young when he died, too. Made sixty, but he made he managed to make sixty three, sixty three films. Okay, right. And, and, and like, um, in like you know, in the nineteen fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties, so he, he was a busy director. Okay, and uh, um, he managed to work. There was another one called. Um, there's another one called The Specialist, another Italian western, which I haven't seen. Okay, I don't know if you saw that one, but I haven't seen it. Can't comment on it. There's there's another one I wanted to recommend, actually called The Hellbenders, with Joseph Cotton's in it. Oh, it takes, yeah. It takes place after the Civil War, and Joseph Cotton and his family are kind of like outcasts, and they're, they have like this, and they're riding around trying to avoid being arrested by by the, um, I think they're Confederates. They're, they're trying to, the Union Army wants them arrested for collaborating with the, you know, with the um, Confederate. It's, it's, a, it's a very well written, very well acted film. Good. Joseph Cotton's very good. That's a good one too, okay, and um, not 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 really essential, but it's it's on it's, it's on YouTube. It's worth watching. Now, there's another one we even haven't mentioned. Burt Reynolds' only Italian western was directed by Sergio Carbucci, also in 1966. Oh yeah, Burt Reynolds went there and made Navajo Joe. That's okay? right. Yeah, where, where and I've seen that film. Um, it's got a lot of action in it. Burt Reynolds kind of plays a very brooding Native American. Who um, is fighting off corrupt, uh, corrupt Indian agents, or uh, they just call them the, the, they're American officials who are supposed to help the Indians, but they're actually stealing from. Them. They were supposed to help the Native Americans, but they're actually stealing from them. Okay. Right, right. He, he's fighting. He's he's fighting uh, bandits, and he's fighting Indian officials, U.S. Indian officials, who have hurt Native American people. So he's playing a very, a very you know, morally upright person. And he's, you could tell he's kind of uncomfortable in the role, though, okay? He's got like this, he's got like this wig on this, to make him look more Native American. <laughs> and, and his performance reminds me a lot of Marlon Brando's performance. Some of Marlon Brando, he's, he's very brooding. Yeah. He stands, he stands like Marlon Brando. If you, if, if you ever watched that film, think about Marlon Brando. I guess he was very influenced by Marlon Brando at that time. But he's, he's good. At it. It's a good film. He's good in it. That's kind of a, what we're seeing is kind of an, an oddity, okay? Yeah. If you, want to see, if you want to see Burt Reynolds in an Italian Western, you might as well see it directed by Sergio Carbucci. It's, that's kind of worth watching. Yeah. Maybe once. That's oh, on my, my list. Way. Yeah. Th- that's also, a lot, of, a lot of Carbucci's films are on um, online. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely, folks, you should check these out. So, Robert, this was an awesome episode. It was very fun. And I'm looking forward to doing future ones. Uh, can you tell the listeners where to find you online? You can find me online. Um, I'm on Facebook, and uh, I have a private account. If you want to send me a, a you know a friend request, I'll see how 
you know, see if I can add you. And I'm also, I have a blog spot. I have a blog on deals pretty much exclusively with Jess Franco. But we also talk about Jess Franco films. We talk about European horror and some other films. It's called I'm in a Jess Franco State of Mind. It's an award-winning blog. I've had it online for like uh, almost 20 years now. Okay. It's won a, a, a credited blogger award. And it's at www.robertmonell, dot blogspot, B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. I also have a, 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 a website called Cinemadrome, Cinemadrome, like Videodrome. It's on Tap and Top. Uh, um, I'll have like, a, I'll have in the next show, I'll have like a, a new link for that, which I'll give out. And that's like an international movie website where we have discussions about movies, where I have a lot of reviews up there. I have interviews up there, a lot of information about a lot of different films, Italian, American, uh, Asian films. So I'll, I'll have a, you know, and I have a new, uh, I have a new link for that, which I'll give out, I'll announce in our future commentaries. Our future, I'm sorry, our future podcast. <laughs> I also do commentaries. Ramondo Macabro, <clears throat> really, really, really fine company. They started out in England. They have Mondo Macabro in the U.S. And they release really, really fine, fully restored editions of Blu-ray, uh, a lot of Euro cult stuff, a lot of Asian cult stuff, uh, just international cult films. Uh, I was also recommend Severn Films, a very good company, uh, Severn Films, and I've I've worked with them before doing commentaries and uh, other things and and video extras. They also reduce, release a lot of cult films. They release a lot of Jess Franco films. They release a lot of European films, some some Asian films, some American cult filmmakers, box sets. They do a lot of bundle box sets now. Um, the, so most of the most of the stuff I review or work I get now and working on. DVDs or Blu-ray, mostly Blu-ray stuff, is with those two companies, both of both of well, both of whom I worked with over the years. And I just wanted to mention them. I'd also like to thank, for his help, Paul Vineyard. Uh, please make sure this stays at the end here. Uh, <laughs> who, help, who helped me out by um, by giving me some information about the dubber that Sergio Carbucci was dubbed by this by this one dubber. Anthony LaPena, an American who went to Europe and dubbed all these actors, he dubbed Sergio Corbucci in a documentary which Sergio Corbucci appeared in, okay? So that's that's his voice. So he recently told me about Sergio Corbucci being dubbed by this guy whose son now works in Italy in dubbing. Wow, and that's awesome. Up. Right. So that's Paul Vineyard. He's he's on, he's on our, our website sometimes. He's a good friend. Um, he also knows a lot about cult movies. So I also like to thank him. And uh, and once again, it was a pleasure being with you to being here with you tonight. I hope we can do this again soon. Excellent, excellent. We definitely right. will. And folks, you can find me on HavenPodcasts dot com. And if you want to send your feedback, tell us um, what you thought about the episode. Maybe give us some suggestions for cult films or anything. Um, comment on what we've talked about. You can send that to HavenPodcasts at gmail dot com. And if you could put Cult Movie Lounge in the subject. Um, I have created a Facebook page for it, but I can't give the address out yet. And uh, Bob, I meant to tell you this off mic. I accidentally wrote the cult lounge and Facebook wouldn't let me change it. And then I went to do it again, like, cause I said, oh, you got to wait seven days. So I went to do it again the other day and it goes, oh, well, th that's not allowed. You can't name it that. I, okay. I can't add the word movie in. I mean, are you kidding me? It, I even created, so it's like facebook.com slash cult movie lounge <laughs> so we'll figure that out folks um don't forget to join us again for the next episode and um we look forward to talking to you again take care bye-bye
shows like the one you just heard, check out the Dorkening Podcast Network at thedorkening.com.